When testing a child, you want to test them in the quietest spot possible. You don't want any background noise, masking, or covering up the results. So often that could be a sound isolated booth or maybe a quiet section of the hospital or the nursery. We use audiometers that are controlled and calibrated sound stimuli. The earphones could be used to test the child to get ear specific information. So in this picture you have insert earphones where we could test the right ear and then the left ear. Inserts work better for babies and children because you don't have these heavy headsets resting on their head that could um, create collapsed ear canals. So inserts are always going to be the best. It's not always possible to get an infant to wear the insert earphones or the headsets. So sometimes we have to test in sound field. And when it's, the child is tested in sound field, that means you can't get any ear specific information. So you would see an S on the audiogram instead of an X or an O. And an S means that the child was tested sound field. So you weren't able to figure out one ear from the other ear. So we have our ASHA guidelines, which you could look over. It might take more than one test session to get a complete result. I know in New York State they allow two tries. So to get a reliable result with a toddler or, you know, three or four year old, it might take two visits, especially if the child is cranky or tired. You know, you could, might be able to get one ear one day and then the other ear the next day. Infants that fail the newborn hearing screening program should have complete evaluations by three months. This includes a thorough case history, otoscopy, and mostly physiological measures. Behavioral measures aren't always reliable for the children when they're very, very young. So you want to get as much information as you can. And we could use a test battery approach where we could use some behavioral Always use electrophysiological when the child is young. And the more information you get, the better assessment you can make. With birth to four months, really the only valid tests you can use are ABRs and OEEs, which we'll talk about in the next section. It's also good to have a case history from the parents or the caregivers. Observing the baby, you could get some subjective information. You could follow a developmental screening or a functional auditory assessment. Once the child has neck control, around five or six months, you could start to do visual reinforcement audiometry. And this is a more subjective test where the infant is actually involved in the testing. As the infant gets older, they might get um, bored by visual reinforcement audiometry. And then you can try condition play audiometry or serial play audiometry. And it's just a way to kind of keep the child engaged in the hearing test so that they don't get bored and so that they cooperate. There's also acoustic emittance testing, which is testing of the middle ear, and speech perception testing, so how well a child understands speech. There are always going to be two audiologists when testing a child, so one in the booth with the child or the infant and one outside the booth running the equipment. Behavioral observation audiometry is what was done before we had OAEs and ABRs. It's subjective, and when I say subjective, I mean the subject is involved and the audiologist is involved because, of course, the audiologist wants the baby to be able to hear, so it's not really a valid test. Responses aren't obtained at threshold. There might be a minimum response level or the softest level when a baby displays an identifiable change in behavior in response to a sound, but it's very subjective. So, like I said, there are concerns with interpretation of the infant state, the methodology that's used, the parameters, the responses that the baby puts in, and of course there's always going to be observer bias. So I really wouldn't, anecdotally, it's good to have, you know, a child startle to a loud sound, but it's not a valid test.
when the infants are very young, you have to use OEs and ABRs. As the child gains neck control, you can use visual reinforcement audiometry. <clears throat> With this test, the child will turn their head in response to a sound. And if a sound comes in and they turn their head when the sound turns on, they'll be re visually reinforced by like a light box of a dancing bear or something interesting. So the child is conditioned to localize to the sound. This works until the kids are about two and a half or three years old and then they might get bored by it. So you move on to condition play audiometry. And you can see in this picture the audiologist is playing with the child and each time the child responds correctly to the sound they're building that block wall. And it's fun. Right? So you have to keep the child engaged and interested to get a valid test. Once the child's around five years old, you can do more standard audiometry. It might be hard to get a full test, though, if the kids are antsy. So you have to be flexible when you're an audiologist or when you're a pediatric audiologist. There's also speech perception testing. This is important for kids with hearing aids or cochlear implants. So to see how well they perceive speech, how well they can hear speech. Um, I, I used this test last summer when I was in the clinic. There was a boy that was um, very uncooperative. He had a lot of other issues going on and, and couldn't get any sort of valid test, but when I said his name, he looked up. And I said his name at like maybe 20 decibels. So having him look up, I got a response. I got a speech perception response, which was the best we could really do. You could also do, um, if, you, if the traditional word lists don't work for the child, you know, get a Mr. Potato Head, point to your nose, show me your mommy, where's your belly, um, stuff like that to keep the infant engaged or the child engaged. <laughs>